We're doing antiderivatives now, and we're looking at number 17. And this problem, we have a stone thrown up from the edge of the roof. This is a thousand feet above the ground uh, at a speed of 12 feet per second. And remember the acceleration of gravity is negative 32 feet per second squared. And remember it's negative because it's down. Not every problem is gonna tell you it's negative. Uh, gravity is gonna be negative, but you do need to remember that gravity is pulling downwards and generally your axis will be oriented upwards. So you're almost always gonna have a negative gravitational acceleration. So just keep that in mind. Uh oh, there we go. Okay, so I've already solved this problem, but I'm gonna go through it very slowly what uh, information we're gonna pull out of here. And there's gonna be a few different formulas we're gonna use. Uh, well, let's start with position and then we'll write down derivatives in that order. Position or height, depending on if, if this is a horizontal movement or a vertical movement. Vertical movement, you want to think about height. Now, I'm not sure why S, uh, the letter S is used here, uh, but this is always going to be the S of T function will be the position function. Whenever I see S of T, I think speed. However, that's wrong. You should think of position. Uh, the derivative is the velocity. Uh, now, if you're wondering what about speed, speed is the absolute value of velocity. Uh, so we're going to use uh, V of T for velocity. And how does it relate to speed? Or how does it relate to position? It's the change in position or the derivative of position. Now we have acceleration, A of T. And that's how the velocity changes. So it's V prime of T. And if you want to relate it all the way back to S, the position, it's S double prime of T. It's the second derivative. So basically, when you move down here, you're going to take derivatives. If you move up here, which we're about to do, you're going to be taking antiderivatives. Good news is all the problems here are just going to be uh, polynomials. Okay, so we have a few initial conditions here. Uh, this problem gave us uh, starting with 100 feet above the ground. So that's a, uh, you could, there's several ways to think about this. We're given this in uh, feet. Where is my beautiful pen? Thank you, okay. So I could use just the units uh, and because it's feet, not feet per second or feet per second squared, it's just feet, just a distance, it's going to be a position. Uh, you can also use intuition and think about 100 feet above the ground. Well, that's a height, so it's going to be s, the s function for a height. Now, a thousand is the height above the ground, but what time does this happen? And that is not exactly written here, but it says, here's where you have to read the problem. Stone is thrown straight up from the edge of the roof. The roof is a thousand feet above the ground, so at the initial time, at zero time, the height is 1,000. So that's how I got the S of zero equals 1,000 right there. Okay, so moving on, we have a speed of 12 feet per second. Now remember, speed's absolute value, so is this thrown up or down? And it's a little odd, but the a stone is thrown up from the edge of the roof, not down towards the ground, so that's why we're using positive 12 right over here. So that's the initial speed, oh, initial velocity uh, is V of zero equals positive 12 because it's being thrown upwards. Okay, they do mention acceleration. Acceleration is not changing, gravity is constant, and it's negative 32 feet per second squared. Now technically the further away you get from Earth the less gravity pulls, but a thousand feet above the ground is going to make no difference, uh, so we're treating uh, gravity is constant. Uh, air resistance has a much larger effect, but that's much harder to compute, so we ignore that as well. Okay, so all we really know are some initial conditions which we wrote down, and the acceleration is constant negative 32. I wrote down the units feet per second squared. So we're going to take some antiderivatives here. So we're starting with the acceleration function, and somewhere begin with the acceleration right here is negative 32. We're going to find the antiderivative. So we have 
variable is t, not x. So you might be thinking, oh, the antiderivative is negative 32x. Close, it's negative 32t plus a constant. Do not forget about the constant you get. You're going to get several constants, so you uh, just keep that in mind. Every antiderivative we get, we're going to get a constant. So what I did next, we need to figure out this constant. So we're going to plug in the initial velocity, v at 0 equals 12. So we're plugging this in right now. We do that right here. Plug in 0 for t, 0, and 12 is what you get on the left side. So that whole negative 32 times 0 disappears at 0. So you get uh, 12 equals c. So we replace that 12 in here for the constant. So we're rewriting our velocity function with the proper value in for c. And we're ready to take another antiderivative. So here, antiderivative of t is t squared over 2, or 1 half t squared. Antiderivative of 12 is 12t. Plus, now we have a new constant. I call this c1. You might be tempted to use another letter of the alphabet, but you want to avoid at all costs using the letter D for anything except derivative. Just like I don't use prime for first powers anymore, you should really try to avoid the letter D. Uh, sometimes you need it for distance, but in that situation, I like to write out the word distance. Uh, anyways, we, uh, we have our antiderivative. Uh, of course, 32 divided by 216. Uh, you're gonna plug in Again, the initial height was 1,000, so at zero time, our height's 1,000, and you're gonna plug that in here. So put in zero for t, and it'll zero out these two terms, and you're just left with c1, and c1 equals that initial height of 1,000. And now you can plug all of this back into the s of t function, and that is your height right there. Now we're ready to answer the question finally, so let's go back and see what they want. So there's a lot of stuff here. How high is a stone six seconds later? So that would be t equals six. And they wanna know how high is the stone, so they wanna know the height. So this would be just s of six. So with that s function, you plug in six. All right, part b, what time does a stone hit the ground? All right, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, if you think about what's happening, Let's scroll back to our function here. All right, so the stone hits the ground at height equals zero. So all you're gonna do is set s of t equal to zero and solve for t. So we have that happening right here. Uh, now, these numbers are a bit big. You could divide out, they're all even. You could divide everything by two, maybe by four. Uh, let's graph this quickly. So here's our graph. It's a sad parabola. It does start at a height of 1,000, and this would be our y-axis. So this height would be 1,000 right here. Uh, I doubt that we're that this is an accurate amount to throw upwards because it looks like the max height would be like 4,000, which would be a very impressive rock throw. I definitely need to warm up before doing that throw. Uh, so. This is not an accurate graph in terms of y values. However, there's one thing that's very accurate about this graph. Our y-intercept is positive, and it's gonna initially go upwards. It's gonna hit a maximum height, and then it's gonna come back downwards and hit the ground at height zero. Now you wanna make sure that you pick the right, in this case, t-intercept. You're gonna get two solutions. One of them will be negative. Don't use that one, use the positive one. So you get two solutions, make sure you use the positive one. That will be the time it hits the ground. And that will be part B, what time does it hit the ground? What is the velocity of the stone when it hits the ground? So I'll label this as T1 for that time you would get. How do you know the velocity at a certain time? That's the velocity function V of that T1 value. And again, you can check you can submit part B to make sure you get your time right, and then go on to part C and plug in the correct time value to your velocity function. Where is the velocity function? You can't use this one because we need the actual C value. So here is the velocity function you would use to get B of T1 right there.